a head-to-toe approach, we probably have a better idea. But these are not the early symptoms. But here again, between the ages of 9 and 25, hepatitis B virus, basically as a sexually transmitted disease, also we know that it's much more common in people who are in, um, intravenous drug abusers who pass on the active ingredient of the hepatitis B virus, which is the hepatitis B e antigen. So a lot of times patients come to me and say, doctor, I've got hepatitis B surface antibody positive. Does that mean I have the disease? No, it means you have the antibody to the disease, which means you were either given the vaccine or you were exposed to it and develop antibodies. If you were given the vaccine, the discussion ends there. If, however, you were not given the vaccine and you got hepatitis B surface antibody positive, then I need to find out, are you infected? Do you have hepatitis B e antigen? Do you have the core antibody that's positive? So it's not something that you just say that, be, that you have a, a result that means I have a disease process. That's why your doctor needs to sit with you and explain to you or dogmatically tell you this is what you have. Let us at least follow the process and see if your liver function tests are high or low. Also chlamydia. Hepatitis C was something else which I'm very, very um, upset about that we're not screening as much as possible for hepatitis C. I've got at least four patients in my practice who were hepatitis C positive, who were never given any medications before because they were not told about the hepatitis C antibody being positive and the polymerase was replicating within the system. Here again, it's not a curative disease, but it's a disease if we, if we treat it, we can suppress it. But more importantly is that we're not passing it on to our sexual partners. And that's the important thing, is the education of it to say, yes, I have this. It is going, may affect my liver function. I cannot drink alcohol. If I take my cholesterol medicine, it's going to make my liver function test even higher. So it's very important for us to know what we have, not because it's going to make us depressed, but to make sure that we can manage our own health properly. For instance, you have hepatitis C or B. You should not be drinking any alcohol. You should be having your liver function test monitored whilst you're on the medication to make sure the, the, the viral load is decreasing because that is what's going to end up with giving you um, liver failure from liver cancer as a result of long-term exposure. And here again, it's the life expectancy that you're looking at, but also the quality of life. The person who's hepatitis B and hepatitis C positive is going to have fever, chills, malaise, weight loss, and they're going to have this feeling of listlessness where they just feel tired and fatigued. And here again, they do not know why they're tired and fatigued. If you know what you have, at least you can try and live a much healthier life with decreasing the alcohol, increasing your exercise, monitor your medication, at least keep your doctor's appointment, and make sure you're asking the proper questions. Am I at risk? Haven't had one sexually transmitted disease. That is going to compromise your immune system to increase the risk of having another sexually transmitted disease or any other disease process that we get from that the ordinary persons whose immune system is intact will not be getting. So you're the person who should be a friend to your doctor or your healthcare facility to make sure that you're properly monitored. Chlamydia is also a very common organism that we find you know, in our practices. But doing the test for chlamydia antigen can show up, but it's an organism can affect the, the mouth, the eyes, and also the genitalia. Here again, it's a very easily treated disease once we have it. The woman might complain of a vaginal discharge or an odor coming from the vagina, and basically the man might complain of a vague burning in urination or maybe even just at times having difficulty passing urine. It depends on if the prostate is infection or just the penile urethra. Here again, it's making the diagnosis and treating because these they are preventable, easily treated diseases. But they're also diseases once we start to produce the bacteria, the, 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 the fungus, the, the virus, it keeps replicating itself and we can spread it from one person to the next, but much more importantly to our sexual partners. And it is important for us to either use protection at all times, say no if you have to say no and you're in doubt, or at least have the person checked out by their physician once they have a complaint, either a bump, a sore, warts near the mouth, near the anus, near the penis, near the vagina. These are areas that you need to be looking at. And those are the areas that you will get the bump, you will get the sores, you will get the blisters, you will get the burning, and you need to be looking at those areas. Any swellness or redness near the vagina or penis needs to be investigated for a sexually transmitted disease. Any skin rash that presents in any typical fashion 
any burning on urination, any difficulty in urination, anything to do with weight loss, alteration in bowel habits with increased frequency of, of, of loose stools and night sweats, anything to do with night sweats in a young person is important for us to rule out um, a sexually transmitted disease, early exposure to HIV, or even hematological causes, lymphomas and leukemias can present in this fashion. Exposure to tuberculosis can also, even in a typical form, when we're actually being treated with medications to suppress a positive PPD. Aches and pains, fevers and chill, malaise, dizziness can also present as forms of sexually transmitted diseases. Yellowness of the skin, obviously from jaundice, from hepatitis um, A, B, or C. Hepatitis A for us is not a disease process we need to worry for. For those of us who grew up in the Caribbean, haven't actually eaten seafood, you can get hepatitis A exposure, but it does not contribute to a decrease in life expectancy. Um, discharge from the penis and vagina, obviously definite reason for us to be checked out. A rash, whether it not be a rash that, that that, 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 that is there and then it's actually disappeared, we should be checked out for it as well. Bleeding from the vagina or that from the monthly period obviously is something. One of the most common causes of cervical cancer is um, post-coital post um, post bleeding and pain in the vaginal area or in intercourse. Here again is a simple pap smear can make the diagnosis and prevent us from get, developing stage 2, 3 cancer to cervix and spreading to the rest of the, of the pelvic area in the woman. I've seen at least about three or four cases over the last year of persons with cervical cancer that basically get spread to the, to the abdomen and also to the vaginal area. Severe itching um, over the, the areas of the genitalia should be investigated as well. Pain on sexual intercourse is also one of the manifestations we need to worry for. But here again, it's the, having a high index of suspicion is where we need to make the, the, the difference here. The statistics are alarming, but it doesn't mean that we should um, be overwhelmed by it. Uh, education and a little bit of, of common sense can make us reach our doctors on time to prevent some what we think are minimal symptoms from manifesting itself to something much more major. And even at the point of time, any STD is a differential diagnosis for an exposure to HIV. And HIV, as we all know, it's basically one of the worst diseases we could ever imagine, especially as it progresses. In my next discussion, we will talk about AIDS and the complications of AIDS um, as we go through the early, the midlife, and the late stages of AIDS. Thank you. That's all for now. Our last few topics have been on sexually transmitted diseases, um, HIV and AIDS. We'll divert a little bit to discuss um, prostatitis and uh, cancer of the penis. Because when we discuss urethral symptoms, either burning on urination, difficulty in urination, the emergence of a rash around the penile area, we are faced with a dilemma in, uh, let's say, for instance, let's talk about the male today, is it whether or not there's an infection involving the penis itself that has spread to the prostate, and is it just an infection as a result of a sexually transmitted disease? Because that's sometimes what is one of the more common reasons why the person presents to the physician. They present with the, to the physician that basically I'm having difficulty passing urine. Obviously, in the physician's mind, it's to stratify what things are more common in a particular age group. For the younger person, I'm expecting to find a sexually transmitted disease. In the younger diabetic person, I'm also looking to find out whether or not this is not a sexually transmitted disease or maybe a disease of an opportunistic infection from the blood itself or from the gut itself or from sexual activity. Because here again, the immune system, our population have a high incidence of diabetes. And in the younger population, may have having diabetes for a while, your immune system decreases and your chances of getting infectious is higher. But for the young, healthy adult, the most common cause that we find in private practice, in family practice, is basically the one with the sexually transmitted diseases. And we went through the common sexually transmitted diseases that we sometimes see, herpes, chlamydia, gardnerella, I've seen a couple of cases of syphilis as well. Um, 
and, and, uh, and obviously gonorrhea, um, or CLAP, as we commonly know it. But in the elderly person who presents with a urethritis, and then will probably tell you afterwards that not only is it that I'm having burning and difficult passing urine, because obviously they would have done their own thing in the first two or three days, they do their, um, their own medication that they find from the over-the-counter or what their wife recommend or what the grandmother or the, the other brother recommended that he's used in the past before they get to you. So in a simple case like that, they come to you when they're now unable to pass urine. Uh, or the difficulty to go to the bathroom to pass urine, they're just able to pass a little bit, but then in the next couple of minutes they want to go back again. Here again we face with a simple problem involving the prostate. This is the prostate, and recognize where the prostate is. The prostate is just beneath the bladder, and it's where the prostatic urethra. The back portion of it here goes back to the testes, where we actually, uh, back to the testes, to the frontal pass, or the vas deferens, where we actually ejaculate into the prostate and through the penis. But what happens here is that the urine from the bladder, because it's a urinary problem now, it's not an ejaculation problem. Retrograde ejaculation can also be as a result of prostatitis, but that's a very much, much more uncommon thing. What we face with is difficulty in urination. And in addition to that, they have hesitancy. Hesitancy, I go, I want to pass urine, but I'm unable to pass urine or I have to wait to pass urine, and when I go, I can only pass a little urine. That in itself could be an infection of the bladder, it could be an um, irritable bladder syndrome as well, in addition to the prostatitis. So the differential diagnosis is not always to jump to the prostate. Even if we look and see what the prostate is as when we are young, under the age of 25 to 30, we have a beautiful prostate, especially if it's not infected. Urine from the bladder goes right through. We can control the passage of urine from the sphincter, and basically we have no problems in peeing when we want to. As we get older, the nodularity in the prostate, and this is not prostate cancer, this is benign prostatic hypertrophy, which all of us, as we get older, will go through the aging process where we develop nodularity within the prostate. Now, if you look at the stream here, it's a beautiful stream of urine that comes right through the prostate, through the penis, and we pee freely. Now, with the nodularity in the prostate, we now have a stream of urine which is now suffering from the fact that some parts of the urethra is compressed and compromised. So we can have a full bladder and then basically we're standing there to pass urine. If there is a flow that's constricted at any juncture, we will not be able to pass urine. But there are other tablets that we sometimes take that makes that problem even worse. Sometimes just taking over-the-counter medication like things like Claritin, etc., and other medications that we some commonly pick from our, our list of medications that we use for our upper respiratory tract infection, can make that situation worse and can convert slow passage of urine to an obstructive uropathy where you're now not able to pass any urine because the prostatic urethra now is totally um, obliterated because of the swelling created by the medication that we've taken. A lot of times we take these medications, as I said, for upper respiratory tract infection, um, cholinesterases, um, things of medication with acetylcholine, and other things that can actually cause the prostate to shrink on itself. There are medications that we can give to release that, but that is in a case in which it doesn't work overnight. The most the e most easily treated thing is if we find out that there is evidence of a prostatic infection, we treat the prostate, and the urine flow resumes. In a much older individual who has also has an increased nodularity of the prostate, now medications are there with Advocar, Flomax, that actually can decrease the swelling and increase the flow of urine. And hence that person can now pass urine freely. If that is not if that does not bring about a solution, then we need to have a cystoscopy and probably a, a, a TERP or a transurethral prostatectomy where we try and clear the passage by just removing a core of prostatic tissue. That in itself brings about a lot of bleeding through the penis but helps with the flow of urine. Sometimes in the process of doing that, we destroy the sphincter. Now that person not only doesn't have they have a free flow of urine, but now they cannot even control the free flow of urine. So here again is that if you think it's an infection, let us treat it rapidly and aggressively. If we think it's benign prostatic hypertrophy and it's responsive to medications 
that are commonly given, hydrogen, Flomax, Advocar, then let us at least treat it properly and try the same time, avoid the alcohol which can call, which is a diuretic, which forces the urine out. And also in addition to the beer,